Hi. Is, uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Erica Lubin, and I'm from the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I am part of the AIM Photonics Initiative. And I'm very pleased to welcome our uh, guest speaker today who's going to lead you guys through this workshop. Uh, Bill Lindstadt is from the University of California, San Francisco. And there he's the Executive Director um, for Career Advancement and International Postdoctoral Services, which is sort of uh, the campus's career and professional development services for all of the graduate and postdoctoral scholars on that campus. So he has many years, over 20 years experience, um, guiding and helping to train uh, scientists and engineers in their career and professional development. So I'm really pleased to have him here today. He is going to lead an interactive workshop. And for those of you um, on WebEx, welcome. And I hope that you're going to enjoy this session just as much as we will here. And um, I want to just mention that we will be recording the session. So you'll receive a recording afterwards as well. And if you have any questions, uh, Brandon will help you on WebEx. And uh, for you here in person, um, feel free to ask us any questions. So you'll notice there are some handouts. And um, there's an evaluation form that save that until the very end so that you can give us feedback on this session. And um, that will really help us develop things for you down the line. So please let us know how we can further help you develop your skills and prepare for your career. So with that, um, I'm going to give the stage to Bill. And please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> um, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, this is a, I seem, seems like a really interesting uh, um, event that you guys are having. And, and it's a pleasure to be working with people uh, through the WebEx at um, UC Santa Barbara, uh, UC Davis, University of Arizona, and I think a few other folks out there as well, right? Um, so uh, welcome. And um, uh, this workshop is interactive. And we're going to do our best to make it work um, for people um, viewing through WebEx as well as um, those here on site. Um, it's an interactive workshop where we're going to have you thinking um, uh, hopefully more deeply than you have before about your career goals and uh, what motivates those career goals. Um, we're going to have you um, working uh, some together to set some goals. And then uh, we're going to finish with um, uh, a poster session basically that discusses your career goals and we have coaches coming in from industry um, so the sort of last hour of this three-hour workshop uh, we have um, uh, some uh, experienced people coming in who will um, hear you talk about your career plans um, based on the poster that you've developed and uh, they'll be here to advise you and, and network with you basically so um, that last hour is just for the po folks who are on site um, we have some alternative instructions during that time for um, people who are watching remotely but as Erica said, um, I'm a career counselor and I've been working with scientists and engineers at the PhD level for the last 15 years, uh, 16 years. And um, at last count, I've had about 2,500 one-on-one uh, -on -one appointments uh, doing career advising with PhD level uh, scientists and uh, postdocs and engineers as well. And um, uh, I would say most of the 2,500 appointments that I've had could boil down to one issue, and that's lack of thoughtful planning around um, what's next in your careers. And um, uh, so with that, I'd like to give you a sort of metaphorical video of what, um, what it seems like happens in my office. I'll call this video um, Graduate Students and Postdocs on an Escalator. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now. Would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do. So, 
So I've watched that video at least 100 times. I still think it's funny, even though it's painful to watch, right? Um, uh, and I think, so when, when a postdoc or a student, um, and I'll acknowledge that in the video, uh, you know, I, I know that graduate students and postdocs don't wear suits and carry briefcases, but um, still, I hope the, hope the, um, the message came through. When, when someone comes in my office for a one-on-one -on -one appointment and they're like, um, you know, my, my PI, my advisor just told me the funding is running out, I'm gonna need to find a job in three months and I'm not prepared for that, I haven't been thinking about what's next. Or, or I've been very successful and I've published, you know, a bunch of papers and, um, you know, people tell me that I might be ready for a faculty position but, you know, I haven't figured out what type of position I want. Um, or, you know, someone comes in and says, I've decided I don't wanna be on the academic track what else is there and um, in terms of other options? And once I find out how, what else is out there, how do I know how to pick what's the best thing for me? And then how do I know how to get into that new career? Um, these kinds of questions come up all the time. And I think um, part of it is because there are some um, uh, uh, potential, I guess I, I would call them problems with the, graduate, with the perceived graduate student postdoc training model that are kind of like the, the um, escalator uh, uh, metaphor. And so I think some problems with this escalator model is it kind of presumes there's only one destination, right? The escalator takes you to what most trainees start out thinking is you know, a faculty position in their field. Um, and that's often not the case. We find that people want to move into industry or, or a, ver a variety of other careers. Actually on the handout you have, if you turn to page, um, I'll see the future discussion a little bit here. If you turn to page 10, there's a list of, I think, 19 different career categories we've seen scientists and engineers move into. And I think within those categories, there are several jobs, almost 60 different jobs. So there's definitely not only one destination at the top of that training escalator. You know, another thing I think is there's sort of overemphasis in graduate education on lockstep training. You, do, you, um, you start at the bottom of the escalator um, as a, you know, as an undergraduate and you were very good at science and someone said, you should go to graduate school, somebody will pay for it, it's free. So, okay, I'll go to graduate school. Then you, someone says you should do a postdoc. And then sometimes in some fields, another postdoc and then a faculty member, a faculty position at the top of that potentially. And I think um, there, there should be space in your graduate training for departure from this and, and um, go explore what it's like to be um, in intellectual property or investment banking or, or um, uh, spend some time talking to industry people like you will today um, that's not necessarily focused right on exactly on your day-to-day -day, um, research work. Um, another thing is that um, the, the model presumes that um, the escalator is taking you where you want to go. So not only is there one place, um, but everyone assumes that, you're, that you wanted to go to the top. You got on this escalator, you must want to finish at that faculty position. Um, and then um, it presumes external control of your destiny, right? So um, I think a lot of graduate students and postdocs that I talk to um, cede control of what's next for them to their advisors or their program or their funding um, and don't think that if I get stuck or if I have questions, all I have to do is take the next step and, and, and take control of um, what's next. Um, when the escalator stops and gives you trouble, um, you're in control to fix that problem. And so this is really what this workshop is about, is to try to give you some structure around how to start um, planning your career, not only in terms of long-term goals, um, but in terms of short-term goals and how to get there. And so um, we'll start right away with asking everybody to grab a pen, let me know if you need one, and write down somewhere on your, um, on your individual development plan worksheet, because we're gonna come back to this question several times. What's your current career goal? And what I hope you'll be able to write down is um, like a job type or a job title and an, and an environment. So um, examples might be, um, I'm gonna be a PI or research faculty member at a research university. And you can write it down anywhere on there. It doesn't have to go in any place. Um, I wanna be a teaching and research faculty member at a state college. I want to be an industry researcher or a policy expert or a field application scientist in a tools company. Um, but somewhere, write down job type and environment. And we're going to come back to this question of, of what you want to do with your career um, four or five times during the, during the next couple hours. Anybody need a writing utensil, pen? Any 
Questions? Oh, it doesn't matter. You can just write it on the front. Actually, write it on the front. Um, So we'll come back to this um, several times as we, as we examine the skills you have, the interests that you have, the, the career-related values that you hold, um, and how, how they may or may not map to that career um, goal that you have. Um, but I'll start by just asking you to answer a, a second question for yourself. You don't have to write this down. And that's about the, the level of confidence that you have. Um, I'm not taking time in this workshop, but we've, um, my group at UCSF does research on this career confidence issue. And what we find in these workshops is when we ask people if you're very certain that this career path that you're thinking of um, in your mind is the best, um, uh, is the best fit for you, um, or if you're not so sure, or if you actually have no idea, what we find is, um, in the research that we're doing, we're finding that more than half of PhD level students and postdocs answer the third question. They really have no idea um, what's next for them. Um, and usually, if we take time in a workshop to ask um, this question and, and take a survey, we usually get about a quarter of the people feel very confident about their future career goals. Um, and I think this is um, why confidence matters. It's kind of self-evident, I think. Um, I, I, I'm guessing that as we do our, finish our research, we're going to find that people who feel confident and have been able to set a clear goal and make some uh, a clear objective and make some goals to reach that objective, I'm going to guess that their training goes faster, um, they have less career satisfaction as they go down their careers, um, and, they, and they find more um, satisfaction with their, um, uh, the training years that they have. Um, so think about that, and if, you, if you're not someone, if you, if you are someone who feels very confident that this career you wrote down is the best path for you, um, then this workshop will be useful because you're going to set some goals for how to get to that place you feel really good about already. But if you're one of that, probably 50 to 75% of folks in the room who don't feel super confident about where you're going, um, we're going to help you figure out a process for how to get more confident, and then work on some um, uh, goals for how to reach uh, the objective that you need to reach. And so really, um, this, question, this workshop, the whole thing is, is um, designed to answer, help you answer two questions. Um, where am I going uh, with my career, and how will I get there? Uh, and it's divided up into three sections. Um, we're going to do some self-assessment and career exploration and talk about how you choose a plan A and a plan B. So those of you who felt very confident that the career path you wrote down do you have a plan B, which is not necessarily a backup, like a, a career that's not as good, but um, often we find that people's goals change as they go along, and they need to be thinking about other career options also uh, during their training. So self-assessment and career exploration, um, career decision-making, how to choose a career, and then we're going to move into the more nitty-gritty goal setting. Um, how will I get there? What steps or tasks are required in the next year for me to reach my, my goals? Um, and then the third part is where we'll invite some mentors in, and they're going to take a look at a, at a, a development poster that you make about yourself and give you some advice and um, uh, networking time around that. And um, the, the group that's planning this um, series has been doing some surveying of folks out in industry, and I noticed... Um, and one of the questions they're asking uh, industry professionals is, you know, what do PhD-level folks in this field need to have, what do they need to bring um, to, the, to industry positions if they're moving into industry? And I noticed that one of the things that was mentioned as a key skill to develop is the ability to sequence goals or steps towards a greater objective. 
And um, that, of course, applies to your engineering work but, um, and your research work. But I noticed that's what we're doing here also. You're taking a larger objective and figuring out how to sequence some goals so that you can be more sure you'll get to the objective. Um, so um, hopefully it's a, a, a useful um, process for you. Um, then I mentioned this sort of divided up into three parts. Where am I going? How will I get there? And um, how am I going to get help from my mentors and, and implement my plan? So um, I thought I'd throw a couple of uh, slides in here just to um, help you realize that I'm not making this stuff up from my own experience about um, the importance of career planning. There's actually a lot of social science literature out there that's been done showing that career planning and goal setting works. Um, and uh, some of the, the individual development plan worksheet that you have there was written by four different people. A couple of my co-authors um, for that uh, did a, a, a survey of, of about 110 articles uh, from the social science literature on goal setting and career planning. And they found several themes. One is that just thinking about um, your career plans um, motivates you to achieve them. So, and to pursue them and then to achieve them. Um, and so congratulations to everybody for sitting through this. Um, you're already closer to your goals just for um, thinking about your goals for the last 10 minutes. Um, uh, second thing they found was that the more specific the goals are that you set, um, the more likely they are to be achievable. So, you know, I think in the future, um, I'd like to be a, you know, a industry researcher in the photonics field. That's so general. Um, that it's not as likely to be achieved as if you have a set of sub goals that are sequenced to reach that objective. Um, so we're going to work on that. Um, and, and a third theme that they found was that developing and implementing strategies to pursue career objectives leads to higher salaries, promotions, uh, more promotions, um, greater satisfaction with your career and, and advancement in your career, more responsibility. So the general literature says um, that this is a pretty useful process. There's been one study done, however, um, with uh, scientists and engineers. So um, across many STEM disciplines, about 22,000 postdocs were contacted. Um, this is in 2005, I believe. And about 7,600 people um, uh, responded. And um, what, the, what the scientific society Sigma Xi was looking for was what factors are associated with um, success and satisfaction in um, the postdoctoral experience. And so with this group of, of doctoral level scientists, they found that after they controlled for all the different factors they were associating with success, um, the thing that made a difference most wasn't how much was the postdoc paid or what institution were they at and what prestige level or what field they were from. It was, did the postdoc have a written plan or not? And those who had a structured plan versus those who did not reported um, that they were more satisfied with their postdoc experience. They reported fewer conflicts with their PI. That's always important. And significantly, they were more productive. They, um, they, those who had a plan um, uh, reported that they had submitted 30% um, more grants and almost 25% more, and had published 25% more papers. So um, hopefully, that's some um, uh, enough um, uh, I guess, raw, raw talk about the fact that career planning is important. And um, we're, going to run in, we're going to get into it right now. Um, so what I'm proposing that people should use in the sciences is a structured plan that's called an individual development plan, which really simply is just it's written on the front of your um, IDP sheet. Um, it's a set of goals mapped onto a timeline in service of your career objective. So big picture goal and how you're going to get there. Um, in the period that this IDP covers, however you deem that to be. And um, IDPs are both a process and a product. Um, the concept of IDPs, um, I bet if you talk to your, um, the, in, the mentors, the coaches that are going to come in later this afternoon, um, I bet if you ask them if they have to do development plans in industry, um, they'll say yes. It might not be called an IDP, but they have some kind of an annual planning process that isn't just um, focused on a skill that they're going to build, but it's how are you going to advance in your career? What do you, their boss will ask them, what do you want to do next? What do you want to do after that? Um, and so it's not a new concept, but it seems to be new in academic training. Um, and um, so, so this is why we're trying to uh, get out there and, and coach people to do these things, because I think it's really useful. Um, so it's a process and a product. The process part is um, a purposeful goal setting activity 
um, uh, by you, the trainee. Um, I talk to lots of faculty members who say, well, I'll, I'll do the IDP and give it to my trainee, um, and that's backwards. Um, you should be doing the trainee and then having a, a supportive, constructive feedback session with mentors. And then it's an iterative, repetitive process. You'll get feedback um, and change it as it goes, but also next year or the next year, you should be um, returning to this process. Um, and there tends to be four steps to most IDPs. There's a self-assessment, so kind of taking, look, taking, taking a look back, um, taking stock, what have you accomplished, assessing your skills, values, and interests. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then making sure you're on the right track, so career exploration. It, it, based on the data I've gathered about myself, my skills, values, and interests, um, where do I want to head, and is that the best place, the best um, direction for me in terms of a, a career objective? Uh, goal setting then is what am I going to accomplish in the next year to get me to this place, um, both to finish um, my PhD or my postdoc work, and then also to reach this post-training career objective. Uh, and then finally, you make all these plans and you have to implement them, and um, hopefully you have or can recruit great mentors to help you um, accomplish all that you have to do. And uh, as I mentioned, these steps are really uh, mentee-focused, so these are folk these are tasks that you should be doing, but then you need to be able to bring in uh, mentors in this last step of implementation. And it, um, this is just to sort of represent the iterative and cyclical process, um, self-assessment, career exploration, goal setting, and plan implementation. And you'll see that um, it kind of maps to these two questions we're trying to answer. The first self-assessment, career exploration is where I'm going. How will I get there is um, goal setting and implementation of your plan. An IDP is also a product, so um, we'll call this sheet when you've finished it, um, at least sort of the last couple pages of it where you're working on goals. Um, this is your IDP product, which is your written document that says, answers these two questions, where you're headed and how you're going to get there. Um, and then when you think about what an IDP should include, so you guys are going to be um, right, you'll finish here with some sort of an IDP today that you'll discuss with uh, these career coaches, uh, these ind industry coaches, um, and uh, we'll put instructions up later for how to make, sort of make out your poster, but it'll have um, some description of what you've accomplished, where you've been, um, uh, how, how you've taken stock of yourself, and then where, you're, where your future goals are taking you. So um, we're going to start in with this process and work through several of these steps. We're going to um, spend some time on self-assessment. Um, I'll explain some career exploration, but we'll skip over a lot of that because it takes um, more time. You can do that on your own. We'll, we'll focus mostly on goal setting and implementation of your plan. Uh, so we'll just start out with self-assessment. And um, if you like, take a look through your worksheet, you'll see that pages two and three are a um, self-assessment of your skills. Pages four and five are uh, an assessment of your values. And pages six, pages, page six has an interests inventory. And I'll explain what those are all about here. Um, so uh, I'm a career counselor. And the whole field of career counseling kind of boils down to the, this concept. And that is um, career satisfaction is some function of, is at some level a function of where your skills, values, and interests overlap. And in career counseling language, um, skills are tasks that you're good at or not good at. Interests are skills or are, are, are tasks rather associated with a job um, that you like to do or you don't like to do. So skills and interests, both about tasks. These are things that you're good at. Interests are um, things that you like to do or don't like to do. And if you think about all the career options available to you, um, you probably would like to pick the, ta the job that involves tasks that you have to do every day that you're good at doing and that you like to do. Um, and then the values piece comes in as rewards or outcomes of that work. So if you can find a job where every day you have tasks that you're good at doing and that you like to do, and that job doesn't have a whole lot of tasks that you don't like to do, and doing all those tasks every day leads to um, rewards or outcomes that you most want out of your, out of your life and out of your career, you're going to be pretty satisfied. Um, the challenge happens that most people have never sat down and made lists, uh, prioritized of their skills, values, and interests, and said, what things am I good at doing, and what things am I not good at doing, and do I care about the things that I'm not good at doing? Uh, what tasks 
um, do I hate to do? And if there's a lot of those in a job, I wouldn't like that. Um, or what tasks do I love to do? And the more I do it, the more engaged I get. And then this is the hardest part for a lot of people is how do I realize that I'm not going to, no job is going to give me everything I want all the time. Um, so how do I prioritize the, the rewards or outcomes that are most important to me? So these skills, values, and interests are just data about you that you can generate. Um, and then what do you do with data? You use it to make decisions. And um, you'll use that data once you've generated about you to make decisions about career options. Um, as I mentioned, most people have never made prioritized like this, lists like this. Um, and most people report that they need help thinking more deeply about this. Like if you just start writing down a list, it's not going to be helpful. And so that's why we have um, some lists of skills, values, and interests. And I'm going to ask you to just jump in um, by grabbing your pen or pencil and work through the skills, um, in the skills assessment on pages two and three. And hopefully those um, watching remotely have printed out this document by, then, by now. And we'll take a few minutes to work through this. So you'll see that there's several categories of tasks commonly associated with science and engineering advanced degree jobs. Uh, and this list isn't something I made up by myself. Um, there was actually a group, a national group convened from the National Postdoctoral Association a few years ago that included faculty members and postdocs and PhD students and industry people um, from all sectors. And they tried to generate as complete a list as they could of advanced degree um, career skills. That's, so that's where this came from. And the other thing I'll say about this is as you rank yourself from one to five, um, use p your peers as your comparison group. So you know, if you get down to the communication skills, you know, presenting science, um, and you compare yourself to your world famous advisor, you might give yourself not a very good score because he's out there or she's out there presenting every day. Um, but if you you're like, actually, in, in lab meeting, I'm pretty good at presenting. You give yourself a four, for example. Yeah. If, yeah, if you have any questions online or in the room, please ask anytime. As people are working through this list, sometimes they ask, um, why isn't there a not applicable um, category as well as one, two, three, four, five for your proficiency level? Um, and the answer to that question is because it may not matter whether you're bad at something. Um, so you may be terrible at a task, but you'll never need that task, so it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, we want you to make that decision about whether it matters or not. Um, later down in the process when you start thinking about your interest as well. We'll, we'll explain that later.
So it looks like in the room we'll be able to finish up in about a, a minute. Um, Brandon, can you ask if people need more time online? Is that, thank you. We'll move on. Um, if you're still working on the skills list, go ahead and finish it. Um, but for those who want to move on, um, go to the, the values clarification list. So that's pages four and five. And I think there's about, um, I don't know, 45 different career related values. Um, and these are, again, rewards or outcomes that you most want from your work. Uh, and if you rank that at one, that means it's completely unimportant to you. You don't care if that reward isn't given to you from your work. Um, if you give it a five, um, that means I must have this reward from my future career or I won't be happy. Um, and I've worked with people who brought this sheet back and they had like 35 of the 45 things listed as fives. Um, try to be a little more discriminating than that um, because this is ultimately about career decision making and you need to um, narrow it down. So I would say shoot for you know, five to eight fives. Turn the battery off. Try to finish up the um, values list, working through that in about a minute, and then we'll move on. 
Um, we're going to stop for a moment and uh, think more, a little more deeply about this values list. So if you're still fin finishing up the values assessment, go ahead and finish it up. Um, what I'd like for you to, to do next, though, is think a little bit about how your values that you ranked as the top values um, uh, fit in with the career options that you've, written, that you've um, uh, th discussed. So um, how does your long-term career goal that you wrote down at the beginning of this workshop on your sheet? So I want to be a research professor at a research university. I want to be a industry researcher or a product development specialist at a company, um, how does that long-term career goal match your uh, values in particular? Um, but overall, career decision-making is how does that goal match your skills, interests, and values? And we'll give you, give you a little practice to, to flesh that out. Um, uh, sometimes people find most helpful, or often people find most helpful, this process of thinking about, am I on the right career path? Is the career path that I'm thinking about um, for my future, that objective, is that the best one for me? Is to take these apart and to try to think about disconnects, they call, we call them. So um, is there a skill that you are going to have to use in that future career that you're not very good at? Um, that would be a disconnect. And that's probably something you can correct, right? You can get better at that skill. Everyone's extremely bright and capable in this room. Um, uh, the values piece, we're going to look at that in a minute. Are there rewards or outcomes that you need or want from the career that's not going to be, that won't be provided? Um, the interest piece, are there tasks associated with that job um, that you really love to do or that you hate to do that may or may not be a fit there? And i just give you a quick example of a values disconnect. It's a pretty simple example. This is a um, postdoc that I worked with um, back at UCSF, life sciences person. Um, and she's an example of what happened when her skills and interests were in alignment, but her values were disconnected uh, with the career path she was thinking. Um, so she and her, her, um, her uh, spouse were both postdocs. Um, two postdoc salaries in San Francisco doesn't go very far, unfortunately, and they wanted to start having a family. Um, and so they were sort of feeling the money crunch that often happens in cities like this or San Francisco. Um, and so um, she, uh, Teresa was ahead of her husband in training. She was, he was a couple years behind her. And so they decided, well, Teresa's going to finish and go get a job um, that pays a lot more money. Um, and about that time, she started telling people, like it's a good thing to do, um, that she was job hunting. And one of the uh, um, microscopy salespeople that worked uh, with folks in her lab said, hey, we're hiring. You know, you should apply for a job in our company as a technical salesperson. Um, and so she applied for that job, did a great job of interviewing, got the job offer. Um, it was a very, very large um, projected increase over her postdoc salary. And so it made it really attractive. But she thought some other aspects of this position were, might not have been the best fit. Um, and so she had filled out this um, values list and went back to it and said and noticed that her top career-related values were helping others, helping society, and family-friendly. And she was like, well, I'm sure you know, selling microscopes um, helps people and helps society, but it's a little obtuse. I'm not sure I can quite connect that. Um, and the particular position was going to have her traveling a lot, so it didn't seem like it was very friendly uh, f um, from a family-friendly standpoint uh, as she was going to have kids. And so she decided to turn the job down as hard as it was, stayed on the job market, um, and now actually is here in Boston um, working as a, a research scientist on sort of downstream uh, drug-related uh, products. So um, it's a way, it was a way to get her family-friendly non-travel um, goals met, um, and she can see how her work now contributes to others in society in a more, in a more direct way. So really simple example of how someone identified a problem with a career, um, which is not the way you might normally think about career um, decisions, like I want to find something I really love to do. Um, but actually, uh, what people find from a practical aspect is um, taking specific career-related things like your skills, values, and interests, picking out some that are disconnects, and figuring out if those disconnects are going to be um, acute enough to drive you into another career, 
or if there's something you can deal with, is a really important um, skill to develop in itself. So what I'd like for you to do to get some practice at that is um, go back to your value summary um, and consider um, the values, the five to eight things that you ranked as fives, and then look back at the career goal that you noted at the beginning, your, your objective, you know, where you want to head in your career long term that you wrote down, and think about what challenges or disconnects you'll face because those values are important to you. Um, and just take a minute to, to write about that. So um, I'll give you an example, another really simple one. So suppose I wrote down that um, I want to be a science teacher in high school, at the high school level. Um, but I look at my values list, and high earnings is ranked as a five. In this country, unfortunately, um, high school science teachers don't make a lot of money. And so that's a disconnect that I would, I would write down and, and, and think about later. So take a look at your, your values list, your career goal, and write down a couple things that you think might be the concerns. We'll move on in about 30 seconds to what to do about these challenges um, and do some problem solving here in a second. So hopefully you've had a moment now to think about your career goal, your values, and how there may or uh, you know, may be some uh, specific disconnects. Um, what I'd like for you to do now is um, get in uh, discussion pairs. Um, and um, I know that in workshops sometimes we don't like to do this, but I guarantee you as you look back on the, at the end of this workshop, everybody always says this process um, is the most useful. Um, and do some problem solving around this. So tell your partner. Um, Introduce yourself, tell them your long-term career goal. So I want to be a science teacher um, in the future at the high school level, but I want to make a ton of money, um, and that's you know, a potential problem. Um, then tell your partner what's one potential solution. So one potential solution to this problem is that you know, I could move into administration and make more money that way. Um, this is a very simple example, I know. Hopefully you guys will think deeper. Um, and then what I think you'll find most helpful is ask your partner for another solution. And people are always amazed at the creative uh, ideas. So maybe my partner says to me, well, you know, you're going to have your summers off if you teach high school. You could start your own company and make a ton of money by becoming a, an entrepreneur. Um, so again, simple example, but you'll, you'll su be surprised if you get some uh, engagement from your, your, pair, your partners. Um, you'll find that really useful. Um, so try to do twos. If you have to do a three, um, that's OK. But um, go ahead and get started now. I'll, I'll pair you up if you need help. You guys. You guys. Can you guys be together? You guys? Maybe you can just sit in with these guys if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry.
Hey, yeah, thanks. Sorry, thanks sorry that I missed earlier. I oh, no, no. Stepped away from chance to talk? Move on in a couple minutes. Thank you. 
So I Okay, if I can have your attention back, um, we'll move on. I sound like there's some great discussion going, um, so, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to give you a chance to talk more uh, in a bit. Um, but I wanted you to think a little bit about these other two components also. So skills and interests, if you think about them together, um, they're both about tasks, right? The tasks involved in a job. Um, uh, skills are what tasks you're good at doing or not good at doing. Interests, again, are the tasks that you love to do or, or hate to do. Um, and it's possible that those things don't fit together, right? We're all good at some things that we hate to do. Um, there's always some tasks that we're not good at doing that we, that, um, that we love to do, and, and those are probably the things that we're going to get better at. Um, but uh, this concept kind of impacts your, the career decision making and the career satisfaction um, because um, it helps to, to make lists of those things. So what, when you're good at a task you don't like, um, how does that impact um, your career? You probably get advanced. We, we all get encouraged to do things that we're good at. Um, and if we don't like to do those, it's helpful to recognize that um, and not continue pursue, pursuing those things. Um, when you lo love a task that you're not good at doing, um, that's you know something that's um, ripe, like we said, for for getting better at and putting and investing some time into. Um, a job requires tasks that you don't like and you're not good at doing. That's a, fa a formula for dissatisfaction, right? Um, and so I think it's uh, really important to to think about a job in terms of the specific tasks that are involved in that. And even before you go job hunting, you know, go read 20 job descriptions with the, with the job title that you're really um, thinking about pursuing and um, start looking for what the commonalities are and thinking about are these tasks that I both like to do and I'm good at doing a real simple exercise for um, career decision making. Um, but for now, I'd like for you to go back to that job that you wrote down at the beginning of the workshop, just like you were thinking about with your values and s consider what a day to day job like is like for that job. Um, what a day, what a day to day tasks are like for that job um, and consider um, the things that you know that you'll have to do all the time in that role. Um, which of those do you need to get better at doing? Which of those common tasks are you good at doing but dislike doing? And which things um, are you terrible at and also can't stand doing? Um, so just take a minute to think and write about this future job that you think you might be in and the skills and tasks, uh, skills and interests associated with it. Okay, so I'd like for you to get back in um, partners now in your pair groups um, and um, do the same thing. So describe the career path that you were on um, and the skills or interests disconnects that um, you foresee. And then um, have a quick discussion about potential solutions for each of those challenges um, and ask your partner also for um, what some potential solutions to those challenges are. Um, and I'll time you about two short times, a minute and a half or two minutes. And when I call time, I'll, um, that means your other, the other partner can switch. Um, so go ahead and get in pairs or threes if you need to. OK, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, Thank you for helping each other. Um, hopefully you found those, those two exercises useful. Um, typically, uh, there are some lessons that people take away from, from these two exercises. Um, one, you probably realized pretty quickly that no career option is perfect, because you probably really identified some, some challenges or disconnects pretty quickly. Um, no matter what career path you choose, there's going to be values-related um, challenges or, or disconnects. Um, your, your, 
no job is going to give you every reward that you want all the time, right? That would be great, but that's probably not very realistic. Um, with every job that you have, you're going to have skills or, or interests related um, disconnects or challenges as well. So there's always going to be some tasks that you need to improve. There's always going to be some tasks that you find a little bit drudgery. Um, and the, the process of, of choosing the, a career that's you know, making you most satisfied is either planning like you have been uh, for how to deal with those challenges or um, throw that career option away um, and move on to something uh, better. And, and you know, good for you at this point in your career for thinking about that um, in, in this structured way uh, rather than you know, waiting 10 years until you choose a career path that's not satisfying and you have to figure it out then. Um, so better to do this um, now while you're still early, early in your career. Another thing you probably realize pretty quickly is that your colleagues can be really helpful um, uh, in, in helping you solve these challenges and brain, brainstorm solutions. And the, the graduate students and, I post, and postdocs I work with say all the time, we don't talk about this stuff in research group. Um, we don't talk about this stuff in lab or even in, in the lunchroom around our lab. Um, and so I hope we can slowly sort of change the culture that it's okay to talk about career stuff and help each other because, because you really can. Um, and then uh, hopefully um, this process also helped you identify some gaps that you probably identified a skill that you're like, I, I would like to use that. I don't know how it fits into this career or I'm really good at um, something, but I don't know if I'm going to need to use that in the future. Um, and so the gaps in knowledge are places that you need to go out and do some more career exploration. We're going to talk about that for about two minutes uh, in, a, in a moment here uh, about how to do that. But um, that's a place, if you don't know something, then that's, uh, you need to do some more career exploration around that. And then finally, um, these disconnects that you identify um, provide a basis for eliminating options. And career decision making just comes down to, you know, I'm taking all the data I generated about myself, everything I know about a career option, looking for disconnects, and figuring out if I need to eliminate that option or not. And so, congratulations, what you've just done is um, uh, the very basics of um, career exploration and decision making process. Um, so these self-assessment results that you have now that you can take with you are data generated about, uh, about yourself. Um, and if you start with a finite set of career options, um, in this case you've been working with one, the, the career path you wrote down at the beginning, um, but there's a list of 60 other jobs in these 19 categories on page 7 um, that you could start with um, and learn as much as you can about these careers um, and then narrow down your options through a structured process of elimination. And this is a great way to help you gain confidence that the career path you eventually choose, whether it's the one you wrote down or not, um, is a pretty good, is a decent fit for you in terms of your skills, values, and interests. And so how do you find this initial set of career options to explore? Um, this list on page seven can help give you a start. Um, it's probably not comprehensive. The list was generated from uh, hundreds of LinkedIn contacts I have and um, alumni lists that we have and um, uh, uh, engineers and scientists we've talked to out in industry and business in different sectors. And um, there's probably other job titles we didn't think of, but it's a, it's a place to start. And most PhD level scientists and engineers that look at a list like this, like I had no idea there were this many career options for people with um, you know, my training level. And so um, that in itself could be encouraging. So we're going to talk a minute um, about moving from this self-assessment process to the career exploration step. Um, and really, career exploration is just a set of activities um, designed to help you learn about career options. Um, you can, there's tons of articles on the web, there's books, there's professional organizations, and so reading is an easy way to find out about specialized career options. You have lots of events on your campus here, um, the campuses that are, um, are on WebEx as well. You have um, folks who help you with your um, career-related options, career centers that hold events about career options. When you go to your professional society meetings, you'd be surprised if you really start looking how many of them have some kind of networking events or actual career panels about career options for, for people in um, your field or subfield. I think the most useful thing for people in specialized career paths and specialized backgrounds looking for people in very narrow um, specialized careers is to, you have to get out there and talk to people. So identify some folks who you would like to talk to and get out there and ask them what their jobs are like. This is called an informational interview. Um, and uh, there's an explanation of them on your handout since I knew we wouldn't have a lot of time to dig into this. Um, if you go to page eight, um, 
there's uh, an explanation of what informational interviews are about. So this is an idea, this is a, a process that you invite yourself to go interview someone who's in a career path that's really interesting to you. And you set up a lit of list of questions. Um, you make an appointment in advance. Hopefully you meet them in person. The phone is OK or Skype. Um, it's not a job interview. Um, it's just an information gathering interview. Um, uh, often these people will give you additional thank you uh, uh, contacts. You finish with a thank you note, and then you've started a relationship with someone that might be a networking contact for you in the future. Most um, students and postdocs I talk to um, say, um, "I don't know anybody in industry, but I bet you're at least well, I bet you're not more than one um, step away from most people in many of the careers on that page on, set, on, on page seven. If you really started asking around." You probably know someone who knows somebody in most of those career paths. And you can get introduced and set up these meetings that way. Um, but um, you can also um, find people through your scientific societies, um, join a professional organization that um, is focused on a career path, um, and th then you have access to folks like that. Or just invite yourself to talk to someone through LinkedIn. I talk to our students and postdocs all the time who said, I invited, I want to exploring what it's like to be a a journal editor, and I found three people on LinkedIn and, and asked them to talk to me, and, and they said yes. Um, sometimes you have to pay for that um, process, that's privilege through LinkedIn, but it's probably worth the $25 they charge you in order to do it. Um, so you go out there and you learn as much as you can about the career paths that are available to you, um, and then using your self assessment data and your career exploration knowledge, information about yourself information about the careers, start narrowing down um, your options through a systematic process of elimination. Um, it's what you were just doing earlier when you were talking to each other. Um, and this process of deciding, where do I want to head big picture? What's my career objective? And then what's another one? Um, so that I can sort of have a couple of different things in mind, uh, ob objectives in mind. The process of uh, getting uh, down to that process, uh, the, the process of making those decisions um, isn't an exact science. Um, but it's deeply satisfying to everybody I talk to, so I encourage you to go through, um, go back and take some time to, to go through this process later. Um, it's also not a permanent decision, so um, uh, what you decide, I think, I think being in academic research, where most of your role models have been in the same career path, they did you know, graduate school, postdoc, faculty member, assistant associate, full professor, um, it's so linear. That, um, that that path is sometimes a, a fairly permanent decision. But what, I talk, what, I, what happens when I talk to people who have moved into other career paths is um, you kind of can't make a mistake with your first career. You go off in one direction. Um, if you don't like it, stay a year, move to something else. Um, and often you'll find that if you look back on it um, years later, you'll find that there was a general trajectory, but not a specified path for most careers. Um, if you find that there's some questions you don't know um, about a career path, um, set some goals around learning more. And um, that's sort of a segue to this next section that we're going to move to, um, which is goal setting. Um, but I wanted to just um, point out one sheet that might help you. Um, if you turn to pages 9 and 10 in your worksheet, um, uh, some people find a structured process of career decision making useful. So if you're considering a lot of career options, if you were one of the people in the room who didn't have a lot of um, uh, confidence about the career that you wrote down at the beginning, and you want to do some career exploration, starting with a sheet like this on page 9, um, and doing some sort of a score based on how well, on a scale of 1 to 5, your, these different career paths match your skills, values, and interests might help you um, through the elimination process. So in this case, you know, this person was thinking about a variety of careers related to education, from being a PI you know, down to being a, a science education specialist for non-scientists. And you can see how they ranked their skills, values, and interests accordingly once they started learning about these careers. So questions about that process? Pretty logical. Not easy, but logical, right? And, and structured. So hopefully, hopefully this will be helpful for you in that way. So we're going to switch gears from 
the how will I get, you know, or sorry, the where am I going uh, part of the workshop to how will I get there. And we're going to start working on some goal setting. Um, and um, what I find is that people need some help writing good goals. Uh, and so we're going to take a minute to talk about the smart goal mnemonic device. How many people have heard of this before? A few of you. Good. Great. Um, so um, there's actually is research out there that shows that goals that are written in this way are more likely to be achieved. Um, so if you wrote, write a goal that's specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-bound, you're more likely to achieve it than if you're like, I'm going to do this in the future. Um, and it's very general. One way to think about um, these is as you're writing a goal, ask yourself, can I break it down into smaller tasks? Um, can I actually measure success? Or is it so nebulous that I don't know if I've gotten there or not? Um, is it written in how verbs? Um, uh, how realistic is it in terms of difficulty and timing? Um, and if not, maybe I need to break it down into smaller tasks. Um, and is there an actual deadline? Is it time bound in the end? So if you write a goal that meets these criteria, um, it's um, most likely to be achieved. Let's let, take a look at a couple of goals. Here's one that um, I found in a list of um, New Year's resolutions, which in the United States, people set these goals at the beginning of the year and then break them a couple days later. Um, so Erica Szymanski said in one of her New Year's goals, I'm going to be holy, perfect, and have fun by, while being holy and perfect. So is that anything in the SMART list? Oh, oh. yeah. Could she break it down into smaller tasks? Probably not. Um, <laughs> could you measure su success? Who knows when she'll get there? It's so unrealistic and difficult that it kind of wipes out all the others, right? So um, total failure, she gets an F on, um, on smart goal setting. Um, so this is me. I set this goal all the time. Um, this weekend, I'm going to clean my apartment. Um, how does this seem on, on uh, the smart Pantheon? Pretty good. It does kind of have it. I mean, the weekend's going to end, so it has a deadline. You haven't seen my apartment, though, so you don't know how realistic it is or how dirty it is, right? It's pretty bad sometimes. Um, so I could break this down into smaller tasks. Um, I could put it in better how verbs. Clean my apartment's not, it's so, it's a pretty big task, right? Um, so I could say, by Sunday, 8, 8, 8, 8 p.m., I will dust the living room shelves, scrub the bathtub, and vacuum the floors. Now, the whole apartment might not be clean, but I've gotten further uh, closer to my goal. Because when I write it this way, I never actually get it done. Um, but if I do this, write it this way, I might actually get it done. So if you're going to make an uh, improvement to that goal, what's one thing you would do? If we look at, if we look at measurable, action-oriented, specific. Yes. Say it again. I would like se sequence them in time. Uh, yeah, like, like Seb said, it, instead of saying at 8 p.m., then I'll start at 7.30 and it's going to be uh -huh. time eight. From this time to that time? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's probably more, because scrubbing the bathtub could take me an hour, right? I don't hope not, but um, uh, right. And I, so it could be on, um, if I uh, put time frames on them, that might be good. What about measurable? I could invite my mom over and have her like test everything and see if it's clean, right? Um, something like that. <laughs> Nothing's ever clean for her, but um, uh, yeah. So, so you can see how um, you could make this still more smart, even though it's a pretty good goal. So let's look at one that's actually more related to um, things that we're talking about in this workshop. We had a student who said, um, I want to be a better teacher. So she was doing some teaching. Um, she was fully engaged in her research, but she was doing some teaching on the side at one of the local liberal arts colleges in San Francisco. And she noticed that sometimes, you know, 20 minutes into her lecture, people were checking their phones, talking to each other, becoming disengaged. Um, and so instead of just saying she wanted to be a better teacher, she said, I want to be a more engaging teacher. I want to keep people engaged. So that's already starting to be a pretty good goal. Um, and then the way she was going to um, do this, the, ta the, the task she was going to do is I'm going to discuss my current strategies for engaging students um, and get more ideas. 
by talking to um, two groups of people, teaching center staff who are experts in teaching, and then I'm gonna go reach out to two faculty members who I think are really engaging lectures and ask them what they do and ask them for suggestions. And then I'm gonna practice what I've learned from these folks um, by doing another lecture course, and I'm gonna do them by these deadlines. So you can see that this goal, you actually believe she's probably gonna get there, right? Um, and so we're gonna give you a chance to practice um, some goal setting and uh, actually write some goals. And if you go to page 11 in your workshop, in your worksheet, you'll see that it's structured um, according to the same skills categories that you had in your skills assessment back on pages two and three. Um, and so what I'd like for you to do is um, uh, select a skill you wanna improve in the next year, uh, and then write a SMART goal to improve that skill. And as you're writing it, think about, can it be a, uh, done in a smaller task? Is it measurable? Is it written in how verbs? Is it realistic? And do you have a deadline? So take just one goal um, and take a couple minutes, pick out a skill that you'd like to improve and write a goal to improve that. Okay, what I'd like for you to do now is, again, coach each other. Um, and uh, what you'll do is share with your partner um, your goal. Um, so what skill do I want to improve and what goal have I written? Um, and then get feedback from your partner. So the, the you sharing with your partner should just not take very long, or you telling your partner should not take very, take very long, but then let your partner give you some feedback. Um, and the feedback should answer two questions. Um, how could the goal be more specific, more measurable, uh, more action-oriented, realistic, or time-bound. So how could they improve the smartness of that goal? And then um, also ask them, what's another method you could develop for um, this skill? So you know, if I'm back to this student who wanted to be more engaging, um, and they told me this goal, maybe I would say, well, you know, um, uh, in terms of smartness, this seems pretty good, um, but it seems like you're not doing, I don't see any measurement in here. And so maybe you could, you know, count the number of people who are sleeping in class every day and see if it gets better. Or maybe you could, uh, that's kind of facetious, but maybe you could um, uh, do a pre and post test the next time you give a lecture and find out if I'm improving my engaging lecture style. Um, so that might be something I would give them feedback to. And then, you know, what's another method to discuss? You know, maybe invite a faculty member to class and watch you lecture. Um, that would be another method. So um, just trying to model what that interaction should look like. Um, so it'd take about two minutes to have that conversation for one person and then switch and have two minutes for your partner to share. Any questions? Okay, great. Okay, if I can have your attention back. Sounded like there was some good advice and good sharing, so thank you again for that. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna give you a chance to write, um, write more goals and then start transferring them onto a, a bigger picture um, uh, objective and goal sheet. And, um, but before I do that, I thought, I thought I'd um, uh, ask questions, see if you have questions about this process because this is difficult for some people where they wanna know how they can you know, write a better goal. Um, and one of the questions came in from uh, WebEx about what, what we mean in terms of um, how verbs or the action oriented piece of it um, and I think um, uh, I'll go back to the example. Um, I think this is, I think this goal, this method, the way this goal is written um, does meet that criteria because you can see it starts with, you know, I'm gonna discuss these things. I'm gonna obtain more ideas. I'm going to give, you know, I'm gonna deliver a guest lecture. Um, so you get an idea for what the person's going to do in order to get there. Um, and that's what I mean by how verbs um, or action oriented. Too many people write goals that um, just start here um, and, and stop. And so you can see how this, ad this action adds the specificity to um, the solution. So that, that would be one um, question. If people online have additional questions about that, I'm happy to add more. Um, other questions that came up for you about this process? Seem pretty straightforward. Any other questions from online? Okay. Um, uh -huh. I have a question, but maybe not, since that's very interesting. So for this kind of goals, we can make it easy. How do we make sure we 
continue to like work on this goal. Oh. There's no punishment, no great. <laughs> <laughs> So the question is about punishment, like accountability is what you're asking for. Um, yeah, uh, punishment would be one method for uh, to, get, to stay accountable. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to talk about that a little bit in the implementation section, because after you set these goals, right, um, it's useless to set a bunch of goals if you're not going to accomplish them. Um, and um, in, uh, I'll, I'll say this now, because um, after the poster session, we may not get to it. Um, uh, people find um, really useful for project-oriented goals. Um, so if you're thinking about something, so this is more process-oriented, and I think what keeps people ag accountable in process or skill development goals is um, focusing on the measurability of it. So actually, that's one weakness of this goal, as we mentioned, but I think she would be more likely, the student would have been more likely to realize that she's a more engaging teacher if she built that measurability into it. Have somebody come in and assess me or set my own self-assessment um, and that's gonna help um, keep me accountable. What people find helpful for um, project-oriented goals for your research project or you have a paper you wanna write is to build in um, sort of interpersonal accountability. So um, ask someone to set a deadline with you and sometimes if that person is slightly above you in rank, um, then you're going to feel more likely to do it. Um, and so as you're writing the goal, solicit that accountability um, and set a deadline for the accountability as well. So that's one, one idea. Um, so um, there's, uh, we think that in an IDP, um, if we go back to an IDP as being a set of goals um, in service of a larger objective, there's kind of, there's the skills development goal. So I know in my training, I have to get better at these different tasks. There's of course your research project goals. Um, if you don't finish your research work and finish your degree or your training, um, why are you here? Um, and then there's career development goals. So now you know that there's some tasks that you might have to do in order to reach the next step. You have to take some training or in order to qualify for a job uh, or you have to um, get some experience to make your resume more built up. Um, those are sort of career development goals. You need to meet people that will help you get to the career, those networking things. So there's kind of three different types of goals. And when you're writing your um, uh, project goals, uh, the, um, a SMART goal uh, isn't write a paper, present a conference, submit a fellowship grant, or reach XYZ project, you know, these types of project milestones. Um, a better SMART goal would be to break it down. Um, and here, you, again, you see the how verbs. Uh, starting with these, and then break some account, build some accountability into it. I'm going to meet with my PI at each point of writing this paper. Uh, and you can imagine how if you write a goal, if you write your write, paper writing goals like that, you're more likely to accomplish them. Um, when it comes to actual experimental goals, um, maybe do sort of the same thing. Break it down by dates, um, and then realize that sometimes with experiments, um, they don't work, right? And so don't get stuck, um, decide a date that you're gonna move on. Of course, this is something you wanna get feedback from your advisors on as well. Um, you know, uh, learning more about, if we think about career advancement goals, learning more about careers in research and industry and expand my network and develop an online presence, um, not very smart goals. Um, this one might be better if you broke it down that I'm gonna read about some careers, I'm gonna attend some panel events, I'm gonna to talk to some people out there, and I'm gonna meet with people um, to share what we've learned and hold each other accountable. That might be a good way to reach your career advancement goals. So I'm gonna take five or 10 minutes um, and, um, and begin writing uh, as many goals as you can for the next year that fit into these career advancement, project goals, or skill development goals. Um, it will probably take more like five minutes. Um, and go ahead and write them out on pages 10 and 11, or sorry, 11 and 12 of your worksheet. Um, and then we're gonna move to this postering session. So we'll time you for about five minutes just to get some specificity down, and then I'll give you instructions for career posters. writing. Um, I know some of you um, may want to move on to the, the next step, which is sort of um, preparing how you're going to uh, talk about your career goals with some of the coaches and mentors that we have. Um, and so um, 
Uh, I'll uh, explain this first. Um, for the people on WebEx, if you want to, um, oh. Uh, sorry, I was not on, on mic. Um, I was saying if you're continuing to write your goals, that's great. Um, uh, you can keep writing. If you're uh, finished and you want to move on to um, start your career poster, um, I'll give you some instructions for that in a second. Um, uh, but I wanted to mention for those who are viewing via Web WebEx, um, kind of finishing up your IDP is a matter of moving to this um, process where you're transferring your goals, once you have a bunch of them written, onto uh, a timeline. So uh, we have a page 13. Um, might be a process of, you know, when you have time, take all these goals, map them onto a timeline, um, share this with a mentor or a colleague, and, and get some feedback on it, um, revise and implement it, uh, and um, repeat the whole process next year. Um, for those of you on WebEx, um, I know some of you are in a, a room and there's a facilitator. You can also um, stay online and um, if you choose to do so as a group, um, you're welcome to um, do a poster session like we, we're doing. You might just want to, want to do them on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper and, and share those with your facilitators. Um, so for our group, we're going to talk about how um, implementation of these plans, it was brought up the question before about accountability, can um, be helped by having mentors get involved. Um, and so uh, I've done this workshop a lot and, and ultimately everybody says this is the most helpful part is this par uh, process of putting down on paper your big picture career goals, breaking it down into some uh, more granular steps, um, and then uh, mapping that onto some sort of a timeline and visually, visually and orally presenting that uh, um, uh, to someone else. And so um, I'll give you some examples of what you might create. So we have posters around the, uh, uh, poster sheets around the room. They're in groups of three because that's how you'll be sharing them. You'll be sharing them with each other as well as with um, one of the uh, uh, folks from industry who are here. Um, and I'll give you some examples as I go through some of these sheets. Um, so this is a very well organized, very well structured one. Um, she starts with her plan A and plan B. Um, and says, even if I'm not really sure what those are, it's basically I want to be not at the bench, but I want to be in a drug discovery environment. Um, and then she broke down um, her goals by skills goals, her, her, what she wants to learn about careers over the next year, and her research project goals, and then had some sort of a summary at the end. And then she was able to use this to explain um, her career uh, goals for the next year to her advisor. This one's a little sloppier, um, but still very well structured. Um, she has her plan A and plan B ideas at the top, some sort of sub goals, um, and then month by month she sort of did it. And I think these, the dots represent different types of goals. Um, and so um, our suggestions, I'll share a few more examples here in a minute, but our suggestion is to start with the big picture. Um, if possible, list your plan A and plan B because um, this is about having an overall objective. Um, consider including some kind of a future focused career map or timeline a visual depiction of where you expect to take your career. Um, and then if you're not sure about plan A or B, that's okay. Don't write it up there, but put some goals on how you're gonna learn more about um, where you're headed. And then have some type of summary of your, of your goals. So um, some of you I saw wrote 10 or 12 goals already, um, and, and that's fine. You could put them all up there, or you can kind of just summarize the types of goals you wanna get to. Um, but then um, the career advisor will be advised to help you get more specific about those. Um, uh, describe highlights of the goals of the year, um, include a timeline or calendar, some sort of sequence. Um, and then remember that you might have to not only develop your skills, learn more about different career path options or the one that you're headed on, and of course finish your research project. And then try to remember to include something about your mentors and what you need from them and, and be creative. I'll give you a couple more um, samples here. Um, this person, um, so this person really didn't know where, the, where they were going with their career, actually. And most of their goals were around, they're like, I just love to do research. I don't really know where I'm headed. This is a pretty junior person. So I'm gonna focus almost entirely on um, laying out my research goals and my research tasks in a fair level of detail. And then I'm gonna engage my mentor in helping me uh, learn introduce other people and connect me to other people. Um, and then I put this one up because it's artfully done. <laughs> um, and this person did it in like 15 minutes too. Um, and so she's got a timeline 
uh, you know, for part of the year. She said, I can't really plan for more than a, a, a section of the year. Um, and, but overall, I know this is where I want to head, and I know I need to get some mentors in a lot of different fields because I only know people in research. Um, and so she used her poster time with, with uh, mentors to try to get more, um, more connected to more people. And then I put this one up here because some of you are not artistic, probably, like me. Um, and this one looks horrible, but it still um, was a very effective method for having a communication with, uh, over the poster. So this person just said, you know, here's where I've been, here's up to today. This is a, a class, a career planning class she took with us. I know that after I get to this course, I'm going to probably learn more about these different careers and I might go into industry, I might go into clinical research. If I do that, it might go this way. And I need to ask some questions of my um, of people at my poster about how I can finish that. So even though that took like a few minutes and doesn't look very neat, it still led to a great conversation and that's okay. Um, so uh, we have materials on the back uh, table. There's pens and sticky notes, um, uh, little dots that you can put. Um, stars, fun things with smiley stamps. Um, be as creative as you'd like. Um, and we'll take about um, 20 minutes um, to create your poster. And then um, and I'll put a couple samples. I'll put these samples back up there, but it doesn't need to look like these. Um, and, and then we'll move into um, a discussion, a poster session uh, in groups of three with, with um, the mentors. So sound clear? So go, go at it. Uh, before we have the, um, the coaches introduce themselves, uh, some instructions. One, um, we'll have, why don't we have the students go two and two so that you can hear each other present so it's not all, all coaches on one student. Um, and then we'll have the coaches divide up into twos as well. And um, spend as much time as you, as you like in your two group. Um, and feel free to, if you've presented, go visit somebody else's group or um, uh, uh, have the coaches can move around as well. With such a small group, we can have a little uh, ability to be free form about it. Um, but to give uh, students an idea of how to make this an organized process, you might um, present your plan by you know, going sort of a sequence like this. My career goal is whatever your plan A is that you wrote down, for example. To reach that overarching goal, I have you know, four, I you know, summarize my goals. Um, I think these are the challenges or things that I might um, you know, find as barriers. Um, I hope I can overcome these challenges this way, and I'd like some mentoring, or I can plan to involve my mentors in this way. So you don't have to follow this exactly, but you get the idea. Um, it's not exactly like a scientific poster at a conference, but um, it still has the same feel. Um, and then uh, we've given to the coaches a little bit of coaching on how to provide feedback, but realize that you guys can do feedback as well. Um, so you can provide um, advice on how the goal could be smarter, um, uh, ask, you know, sort of challenge on how the goals that are written uh, feed up to the objective. Um, you could have additional ideas for skill development or career development goals. Um, challenge a person on overcommitment. It looks like you're doing too much in February. How are you going to ever get that done? Maybe you should spread it out. Um, and then um, try to focus on uh, sort of networking contacts and mentoring advice as well. Is that clear? All right. Um, Sorry to interrupt, because it sounds like there's really great conversations going on. Um, we can leave the barrier here between us. <laughs> um, but um, we'll kind of, we'd like to be respectful of everybody's time and, and uh, wrap this up. Hopefully, discussions can continue you know, off-site or offline, um, because it sounds like some really useful um, advice being given and, and information being shared. So um, thank you, everyone. We wanted to kind of wrap up with um, a couple of questions. Uh, and, and for the trainees or the mentors, the coaches, um, what did you find particularly useful about this part of the process? Yeah, from, <laughs> from, a, from a technical standpoint? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Kind of fun remembering my, my 30 years ago self. <laughs> <laughs> for, for me, this is the first time I've written any of this down. And so it, it's just good to have these conversations. Uh -huh. So it's been in your head before? Yeah, but not, but not formally put on paper. And you know, it's just the first time. But I'm sure every time I write it down or think about it, it'll become more clear. Yeah, the thing for me is like, 
um, not productive if there's no deadline. So <laughs> this is kind of <laughs> deadline. It forced me to think about everything. Otherwise, I just think, OK, I have an important meeting next week, so maybe after next week, I'll think yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, rush for the preparation. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, a, from, this is the accountability guy, right? You're the, right. Um, good. Um, and what could be done to make it more useful? Or how could it, be, how could it have been more useful? So I think, I was just going to say, I think the frequency of this is probably an important aspect. Um, so my background when I went through university was actually a cooperative engineering program. Oh, so yeah. I did four months of work, four months of school, yeah. all the way up through graduating. Um, that's not very common, but it's pretty common in Canada for a couple of the universities up there. Uh -huh. Having that moving back and forth, you found mentors, you found networking, you found the things you don't always get when you're just strictly going to school. And I had a lot of colleagues that went to another university that didn't have that program. And when they graduated, I graduated having a job in the late 80s, which was not easy at that time. Um, they graduated. My one buddy of mine stayed in school to get his PhD. The other one went to Australia to go work for Australia Telecom because he happened to be an Australian citizen, so we could go do that. But, you know, that type of being able to touch, I think, is, is probably useful for a lot of students. The ability to say, question, am I doing the right thing? Am I looking at it the right way? Am I, and how do you get that? That's industry contacts and professors that have you know, been, been there, lived there. Periodic feedback. Yeah. Uh -huh. Other ways it could be more useful. So I, I would say something very similar, that uh, the, the path to a career is not something you can plan. I think it's something you experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, to even getting the first job isn't a linear process. Uh, you, there are 20 rejections before you find the magic connection. And if it's, if it's a good connection, you're lucky. If it isn't, You've got the experience you can gain from that to apply to the next one. And it's all about, you know, what, where, what do I have in my toolbox now? What can I add to it? And then how can I take those tools and do something better and better and better as far as my own uh, set of goals? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no such thing as being discouraged because you're always gaining. Right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know. I, Knowing and the three the, of us, and we were beating up on him on, on job security. I'm like, take that off of there. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Forget job security. It's not worth it. It's much more fun not I, to be I job security. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much the view I have too. I mean, we talk a lot in, in education circles about pathways and not mm -hmm. pipelines, but I think you know these processes tend to be very linear. Yeah. But yeah. they are forcing you to think about options and think about multiple pathways, and they're not. As Kim said, they're not pathways that diverge and then stay apart forever, right? There's, there's always opportunities to move back and forth between some of these different realms and to add, add skills and different things. Yeah, it's it's very tough. Uh, you know, when I remember when I graduated, the first company I worked for, the first thing they did is they sat us down and said, "What's your five years?" I don't think I'm out. They said, "I don't know." Uh -huh. Honestly, I didn't work five years later. I didn't work for them. So obviously, the five-year plan would have been useful. Um, not that it's not a bad thing to have a goal or something you aspire to or something you want, but don't be scared to take a different path to get there. Uh -huh. there are, those paths open up so many different opportunities. And talk to the people that come from those opportunities. The biggest thing I think still, it's funny, I work in the networking industry, and I say one of those worst things we have in the networking industry is no one knows how to network. Uh -huh. they don't right. talk to each other. So yeah, yeah. Talk to people. I mean, there are people that have some incredible careers. And, you know, I've talked to guys that are you know, years ahead of me, some of them that are retired, some of them that are, are, you know, just starting their careers, but everyone has such a different perspective on where things are going and where yeah. the opportunities are. And don't be scared to go work for a startup. Don't be scared to go work for, I mean, I've worked for three startups in my life. All of them have been successful. So, you know, you can do it. But, you know. Uh, I, no, I think a really useful takeaway message from this feedback is that um, with the, the linearity of this process we're teaching, um, should be tempered by uh, real life stories of how even if you do have a plan, which you should have some kind of plan, um, it could diverge quickly. And, yeah, exactly. Um, so so that, that's a really good point to make about.